Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. You hear it often said on the news whenever the occasion comes about they have something positive to report on about the good Samaritan who pulled the cat out of the tree or the good Samaritan who did a generous thing for the person crossing the street or who in some way paid it forward as a good Samaritan. I think if you were to randomly ask any group of Christians what it means to be a good Samaritan, they would tell you Jesus commands us through his parable that Jesus tells us to be gracious, to be kind, to take care of those who are in need, those who are discriminated against, those who are disenfranchised, that we are commanded and should help those who can't help themselves. That's quite often the message you hear preached about the parable of the Good Samaritan from many pulpits today. The problem with that message is that though Jesus certainly does tell a story about a man who selflessly and generously helped someone, victim of a robbery, and though, yes, Jesus and God certainly do command us to be good to others, to take care of people, to love everyone, even our enemy, that message is not the express teaching of Jesus in the parable of the Good Samaritan. The truth that Jesus is teaching in this story is far more unattractive than that. The truth that Jesus is teaching through the parable of the Good Samaritan isn't a truth you're going to hear about on the news, and it certainly won't be one you find in your everyday Christian self-help book in the store. Jesus is giving us a truth, quite frankly, that we don't want to hear, and a truth that the Jewish lawyer, as we read, did not want to hear, but a truth that Jesus gives us because He loves us, because He desires for you and I to come to a place of repentance and faith so that we might be forgiven of our sins against God and the harm we've brought to other people because of our disobedience to the Father. Go and do likewise. With those words, Jesus ends his parable of the Good Samaritan. You go and do likewise. Okay, do what exactly? Well, our text makes clear that the intentions of this lawyer were not very pure at all. Luke tells us in verse 25 that a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And it's in response to that question that Jesus gives us the parable of the Good Samaritan. What must I do to inherit eternal life? See, words are important. You have to listen to words because by simple definition of inheritance, you don't do anything. You don't receive an inheritance because of what you do. You receive an inheritance because of who you are. This Jewish lawyer no doubt thought he was someone who was capable of being worthy of God's grace and forgiveness, that he either had or somehow could do whatever God required in his perfect almighty law to merit living forever. I think the only thing more obvious than this man's hubris and pride was his foolishness. Luke tells us in verse 25 that he stood up to put Jesus to the test. That ranks as one of the most foolish things I can think of. Jesus being the definition of truth, Jesus being the one through whom all things were created, the author of anything we can know, is not fooled. Jesus sees through this man's vain attempt to pull one over on the Son of God, and in response to his question, as Jesus often does, he will ask another question that will not only reveal to the lawyer and everybody listening the malicious intent of his question, but more importantly, it will ultimately reveal 
who the lawyer is and who he's not, who we are and who we're not. The lawyer asks Jesus what he has to do to inherit eternal life, hoping and thinking he'll trap Jesus in his words, make him contradict himself, get him caught up. In response, Jesus says, well, you're a lawyer. You claim to be an expert in the law. Tell me, what is written in the law? How do you read it? In his pride, the lawyer is quick to answer, quoting Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19 that we read, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, with all your mind, all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Well, the lawyer's answer is absolutely correct. That's what God's Word says in His law. And Jesus validates His answer, and He says, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Simple uh, simple enough answer. I mean, it's not a confusing answer of Jesus. Do this, and you'll live. What you just said, do that. Love God with all of your heart. All my desires, all day, yes, all. Love him with all your mind, all my thoughts, all the time, yes. All your strength, everything that you do, everything you put your hand to. All my soul, with every essence of your being. That means all your time, all your energy, all your effort, all your treasure, all. If you want to get to heaven, if you want to receive the inheritance prepared for you through what you do, that's what you have to do. And there is no measure of perfect. It's perfect or it's not. Have you ever had one of those moments in your life where you feel like you're just absolutely determined to find out how much of your foot you can actually fit in your mouth? That's where the lawyer is at this point. Clearly, the lawyer realizes he was caught up in his own trap. And sadly, instead of at this point admitting to Jesus and saying, well, I can't do that, Instead of saying, I haven't already done that, he tries to find a loophole. I mean, he's only doing his job, right? He's a lawyer. That's what they do. And as soon as he thinks he finds one, he shoots it right at Jesus. And he says, okay, yeah, but who is my neighbor? This man was clearly very intelligent, very witty, and I'm sure very successful. But this man also is a man who has clearly not yet had his heart broken by the reality of his depravity and sin. If there was any hope of saving this man and opening his eyes to the truth, giving him the love and mercy and salvation of God that was staring him in the face through the eyes of Jesus, our Lord was going to have to shatter this man's heart of stone. And it's ironic because he uses the parable of the Good Samaritan, a parable we associate with many different things, to break that man's heart of stone. You have to remember who the Samaritans were. They were the sworn enemies of the Jews, and the Jews were the sworn enemies of the Samaritans. The Samaritans were half-breeds, half-Jewish, half-Gentile, and that was only because they disobeyed God in captivity and intermingled with surrounding nations. Even at the point that this parable was being told by Jesus, the Samaritans were claiming to be sons and daughters of God and doing a whole lot of things that were very much in the wrong direction. To the Jewish elite, Samaritans were filthy and undeserving people that you look down your nose at. To the Jewish elite, they didn't like Jesus and hated him just as much because he associated with Samaritans even a Samaritan woman at a well. Other than Jesus, there was no greater enemy to the Jews than the Samaritans. So when Jesus says in the parable, 
that it wasn't the Jewish priest, it wasn't a pastor that stopped and helped a helpless person. It wasn't the Levite, a church worker, that stopped and helped. It wasn't even a Jewish layman that stopped and helped, but a Samaritan. A Samaritan who so generously cared for this helpless man and who actually fulfilled the law of God in doing so. Then Jesus puts a bow on it just to drive the point home with this young lawyer. You go and do likewise. Now, it's not what Jesus' teaching is, but undoubtedly what this lawyer heard with his ears was, you go and be a Samaritan. You go and love and fulfill God's law like a Samaritan. You give selflessly of all your heart and all your soul and all your strength, just like a Samaritan. And by the way, love that Samaritan as yourself. Now, as offensive as it would have been to hear Jesus say that, that a Samaritan fulfills God's law with his charity, the charity of the Samaritan was neither the point of Jesus' teaching, nor was the charity of the Samaritan the most offensive part. Like the lawyer, we have a tendency of identifying ourselves with the Samaritan in the story because we think the Samaritan is the main character in the story but he's not. If the point of Jesus' teaching was to teach us the importance of loving all people as your neighbor, even your enemy, then Jesus would have told the story with the Samaritan being the one that was beaten and robbed. Mr. Lawyer, if you want to inherit eternal life, then you must love even a Samaritan as you would love a Jew if he was beaten and left for dead. If that was the point of his teaching, the Samaritan would have been the man in the ditch. But that's not the point. The man who was robbed and beaten is described only as a man. We don't know if he's Gentile. We don't know if he's Jew. We don't know anything about him other than he is one of us. And I think that's exactly the point. Both Jew and Gentile should identify not with the Samaritan, but with the man half dead and naked in the ditch. We should also note that when he had finished telling the story of the Samaritan, Jesus asked this question, which of the three men, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, considered the injured man his neighbor and loved him as such? If Jesus' point was to teach us to love our neighbor better, that's what he would have asked. But that's not what he asked. What he asked was, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? You have to remember what question Jesus is answering. Or, I'm sorry, what question the lawyer asked. He said, who is my neighbor? Through this parable, Jesus answered the question, well, your neighbor is the one who proves to love you. Your neighbor is the one who brings you life when you are dead. Who is your neighbor? Your neighbor is the one who sacrificially gives of all that he has for your sake. And you are dead, Mr. Lawyer. You are the one in the ditch. The point Jesus is making, I think, is clear. Neither this lawyer, nor the Samaritan, nor you, nor me, nor anyone has, can, or will ever love God with all your heart or all of your anything. Jew or Gentile, red or yellow, black or white, Democrat or Republican, Old Testament or New Testament, we are all in our nature, through and through, depraved and sinful, void of any righteousness that could earn us eternal life. Psalm 14 says, none is righteous, 
No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And certainly calling upon Psalm 14 in the New Testament, St. Paul says in Romans 5.12, sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. If you're going to die, then you have sinned. All means all. Death is the great equalizer. And as I turn on my television and read the newspaper and hear of all this tragic stuff going on, stuff that shouldn't be, I always think to myself, we have forgotten one of the most simple truths. We're all going to die we will all answer to our maker. When we forget that, things get messy. Our sin has left every single one of us naked and dead before the eyes of the Almighty. Jesus, in his teaching of this story of the Samaritan, is teaching that everyone is your neighbor because everyone dies, because everyone sins, so welcome to the neighborhood. That's what Jesus was trying to reveal to this lawyer and to you and to me, to bring us to that place of repentance and confession of our one true condition before God so that we would not only realize the depth of our depravity and our need for God's self-sacrificial love and forgiveness, but also realize the truth that that is what he has given in Jesus, who alone is the Good Samaritan. Go and do likewise, Jesus said. We have to remember that ultimately Jesus is saying that in response to the lawyer's first question. What shall I do to inherit eternal life. It's in that answer that Jesus says, you are the man in the ditch. Your neighbor is the one who saves you. I am your neighbor. Now go and do likewise. Go and die so that I might save you. I very much like how theologian Arthur Just Jr paraphrases Jesus' teaching in this parable. The lawyer says, I will act to love my neighbor as myself. Tell me who he is. But Jesus answers, you cannot act, for you are dead. You need someone to love you. I am the one you despise because I associate with sinners, but in fact, I am the one who fulfills the law, who embodies the Torah, and who brings God's mercy. I am your neighbor, and I will give you the gifts of mercy, healing, and life. As I live in you, you will have life and will do mercy, not motivated by laws and definitions, but animated by my love. You know, the thing about an inheritance, it requires something. It requires a death. And though we all die, it is not our death that brings us the inheritance. It's his. The death of Christ our Lord is what opens up the heavens for us. We will receive the inheritance not because we die enough, but because he has died for us and given us his life through his own resurrection. You are, I am, and anyone who believes in Jesus are children of the Most High God. Those who are children and rightful heirs, Jesus says, with him to heaven itself. And only because he loved God with everything he had when he gave up everything on the cross. So now that we know who we truly are in Christ, he says to us, go. Let us go and do likewise, because Jesus is your neighbor, and Jesus loves you, 
So welcome to the neighborhood. Amen. Let's pray.